If you will indulge me for a moment, I come from the tradition where we stand for the reading of the Word of God. That's why I feel so at home, because guess what? So do you. And I want to take you to a passage of Scripture this morning. And if you're watching online, we thank God for you. We welcome you. We celebrate you. God's going to meet you right where you are, right on YouTube, right on streaming, wherever you are. The thing I love about God is that He's omnipresent. Ah, oh, my Lord, have mercy. That, 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 that means that he is everywhere present, but that doesn't mean he's in everything. Oh, that'll bake your noodle right there. He's everywhere present, but it doesn't mean he's in everything. And for him to choose to dwell in us, come on, is absolutely incredible to me. And so he's omnipresent, which means that he can meet you in your bedroom and in your living room and in your kitchen and in your car and in your cubicle. Wherever you are located right now, God can meet you. And if you are lost, lost is a location. God has your coordinates right where you are. I want to take you to Revelation, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And if you will indulge me just for a little bit, since we are in church, I also need to read to you from Revelation 5. And I have to take my time to give you the scriptures of verses 1 through 10 in Revelation 5 because I have the responsibility to make sure that the text is in context. And so I want to make sure that you can understand this story, this picture, this scene that we are about to drop into. And as you're finding the scripture, if you're still looking for revelation, I don't know why. It's in the back of the book. <laughs> And as you find yourself in the book of Revelation, the fourth chapter, I need you to understand just for a moment as we jump into this story that we are jumping into the middle of a scene. And through John's eyes, we are having the opportunity to be flies on a wall. It seems as though we should not even be able to see what he is seeing. It seems as though that we should not be privy to this private affair, but somehow God in his magnificent wisdom wanted to make sure that we could see a scene in glory. Uh, and so as we step into this text this morning, we're stepping into something that is on God's heart and on his mind and something that he has been working on for a very long time. And so Revelation 4, 1 bears out these words and the scripture says, then I saw, then I saw, oh my, 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 what's the name wants to act up? So I'm going to put that right up on the screen. Revelation 4, 1, there we go. After this, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. Uh, I, I got to say that again. Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Woo, glory to God. Somebody shout, something going to happen after this. <laughs> Revelation 5, 1, and if you'll indulge me, I have to read these 10 verses. It says, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. The scripture says, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll? and to break its seals. <laughs> and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. <laughs> and I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. <laughs> 
weep no more. <laughs> the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. <laughs> and between the throne and of the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Wait a second, I, I just thought he saw a lion, but the Bible says between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. How can a slain lamb stand? How can something that's supposed to be slain, which means dead, which means over, which means finished, still be standing? Can I prophetically interject this into your spirit? You can't kill what God wants alive. Oh no, come on Holy Ghost, I'm gonna say it over here. You cannot kill what God wants alive. And it was standing there as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints and they sang a new song saying worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth <laughs> If I can bring your attention to Revelation 4.1, when John says these words, and I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me was like a trumpet and it said, come up here. For the next few moments, beloved, that we have together, I want to talk with you from the subject titled, It's Up From Here. Ma 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 Lord, it's up from here. Spirit of the Living God, we thank you for this moment, this opportunity, this reserved spot that you have set and ordained for us today to come into the counsel of the Lord and hear, thus saith God, Father, this is not a sermon. This is a prophetic declaration. This is not an ordinary time. This is a Kairos moment. You've brought us here for something amazing to happen. And we yield ourselves to you in this moment. We yield ourselves, Father, because the Word is the only thing that can separate soul from spirit. Our praise can't do that. Our prayer cannot do that. You said the Word is quickening. It's Powerful. What does that mean? It's got a built-in defibrillator that every time we hear it, we're resuscitated in our souls and in our spirits. It makes us to come alive. And while we're coming alive, you're doing the surgery on our hearts and searching its intent. We thank you for that type of word that comes, the word that causes us to be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. The word that transforms us by the renewing of our minds, touch our hearts so it's open to receive this word and anoint our ears that we're able to hear it. 
Father, we thank you in advance for what is about to take place in our lives. We thank you for what you have already done. And we thank you for what you're doing in this very moment. And we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. Come on, give God some praise as you take your seats. It's up from here. Beloved, we are living in a transitional age, a period and a time of change. And when we are living in a period of time of change and dealing and enduring protracted seasons of difficulty, such as the time and season we find ourselves in, it is quite disturbing. It would seem as though things are falling apart more than things are falling into place. <laughs> the uncertainty of it all makes us worry a little bit. And if you're sitting here with a mask on your face acting like you ain't worried, you're lying. I know we're all spiritual, and I know that we all have faith, and I know that we all have fervor for the things of God, but the reality of it is, is that there is some scary mess going on. <laughs> uh, you would not be human if you did not realize that. You would not be human if you did not feel those emotions of everything that is looking like calamity and collapse surrounding us at every turn. Yet, and still, we have Scripture to help us in these moments. Scripture like Psalms 91 that says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and He is my strength. And it goes up from there and begins to let us know that there's a whole other dimension of being surrounded by calamity and collapse, that a thousand can fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand and none of it can come not you <laughs> it is amazing that scripture helps us to understand that but it is still a reality that even though we have scripture to help us that oftentimes we don't use it in moments of crisis and calamity the way that we often should and so it makes us worry. And what's worse about the way that we worry is that we're worrying about the future while we are simultaneously trying to understand the present complexities of the circumstances that we face every day. So not only do I have to worry about everything that's happening on the outside, I also have to contend with everything that's going on on the inside. It is in these types of moments that cause us to live on the edge of tomorrow where it becomes virtually impossible and, and extremely difficult to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness so that all these things that you're worrying about can be added unto you. It becomes very difficult in these moments. It becomes very difficult when you're in survival mode all the time and have yet to step outside of your survival into the flourishing and the thriving that God has for your life. Just let me give you a spoiler alert to the message and look at your name and say you're about to go from surviving to thriving just like that. Go and do it. Go ahead and do it. Look at somebody, but make sure you snap your fingers if you're online, if you're in your living room. Look at the dog and look at the cat and say, I'm about to go from surviving to thriving. Help me, Holy Ghost, because I'm trying to do good with this message and give it to you the way he gave it to me, but I feel something pushing me already in my back. Just look at your neighbor real quick. You got your mask on, so it's okay. And say it one more time. You're about to go from surviving to thriving just like that. There is in the realm of the spirit an accelerated push to take you from where you are to where 
you are about to be. Ooh, help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. And, and so we find ourselves in these difficulties, and there is no question that there is plenty to be worried about. There are pandemics and, and Delta variants and, and, and political unrest and systemic inequalities and violence and the myriad of atrocities around the world. There's trouble everywhere. Not to mention, as I said before, our own personal struggles and situations that suggest that we can't get a handle on this and that oftentimes slips into our mind when we start tripping and and start losing our, our, our thoughts and our, our processes of trusting God a little bit to make it feel like that God does not have a handle on this. But I came to serve somebody notice and most importantly to let the devil know God's got an absolute handle on it all. <laughs> you see, most of our skepticism, our anxiety, our aggressiveness, are rooted in panic. <laughs> panic. And so we find ourselves at the height of contemporary panic. We have all the technological advances in the world, but we still have panic. You can get all the information you want at the click of a button, but we still have panic. Ah. You don't even have to be a doctor. You're diagnosing your own self. <laughs> but you still got panic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have more subject matter experts, more degrees than a thermometer, but we still have panic. <laughs> and we find ourselves in this moment of contemporary panic. It is no wonder that they describe panic as an attack. A panic attack is a sudden and intense feeling of terror, a sudden and intense feeling of fear or apprehension without the presence of danger. So nothing's coming. You can't see anything, but you still feel like you're under danger. It's one thing to be under attack by something you can see. It's another thing to be under attack by something that you feel. Oh, y'all not going to be honest with me up in here. Y'all not going to be honest with me. If I can see it coming, I can fight it. But it's very difficult to be fighting on the inside against something I don't even see. I just feel it. And the feeling can become so powerful that it soaks into my imagination. And I start believing it as real, but it hasn't happened. I need you to understand that reality is never your enemy, yet it is always your canvas. Reality is not something that you should fear, yet it is something that you should embrace. Because the God we serve showed us when he began the beginning that he can take any reality and reorder it the way he wants it to be. Come on, work with me, work with me. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning. As a matter of fact, in the original context of how it was written, the word beginning is plural, that that's very important. And so it says, in beginnings, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. This is where God decided to start the story. The reason the beginnings, the plural version of it is important is because if you say in the beginning, it suggests that God began when the beginning began, but God began the beginning. So he decided, this is where I'll start the story. And I'll start it in the moment of order and then allow the disorder to come in. I'll start it in a moment of cosmos and let the chaos come into the narrative because I'm not afraid of the reality of the chaos because I am God. So I can step into the chaos and begin to reorder the chaos and rearrange it and reorder it to a new creation. That means 
that God can take your life and radically rearrange it. Oh, I'm going to say that one more time. God can take your life and radically rearrange it. I think I got some folk in the room who can bear witness to the testimony that God can take your life and so radically rearrange it that if I told you my story, you wouldn't believe half of it. Is there anybody in the room that doesn't look like what they've been through? If you don't look like what you've been through, just go ahead and shout hallelujah right now. If you look down your row and somebody is sitting at you looking at you like you crazy, just tap them on the shoulder. Well, don't do that because we're in the pandemic. But just look at them and say, if you've been through what I've been through, you would be praising also. If you look like what I used to look like, you will be shouting also. If you were sick like I was sick, and I'm standing here healed and blessed of the Lord, you would be. My God, I feel a healing anointing coming in the atmosphere right now. Somebody shout, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. Just go ahead and shout out, somebody's getting healed right now. Don't sit on it. Go ahead and shout, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. From the top of my head to the soles. We are under attack. And the attack is panic. What's funny and interesting to me about panic is that it's a sudden burst of, of information that enters into your imagination that makes you feel a certain way. Conversely, a revelation is the same thing. A revelation is a sudden burst of a knowledge of God. So panic comes from information, but my praise comes through revelation. I don't praise God because I'm informed of Him. I praise God because I know Him. I give Him praise because I know what he's done for me. When David said, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth, that's a personal thing. <laughs> I don't praise God because you told me to. I don't praise God because the praise team said, lift your hands. Baby, I got a reason to lift my hands. I got a reason to do my dance. I got a... A revelation is a sudden burst of knowledge about God that you never had. It's not that it's new. <laughs> it's not that it's new, it's that you've never seen it before. The scripture says, the Lord, the Lord says, behold, as he told John, I make all things new. He didn't say, I'm, I'm making new things. Oh, y'all, come on, come on. He, he, he didn't say, I'm going to make you new things. He says, behold, I make all things new. That means he can take what I already got and make it into something completely. 
He can take my business that's struggling and make it into something that's completely. He can take my marriage that's struggling and make it into something. Com he can take my life that's messed up and make it into something completely. Different. We're under attack. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I love the way Eugene Peterson says, Eugene Peterson wrote the Message Bible, and he said, the, the tools of our trade are not of this world. So when you see me praying, I'm using my tools. And when you see me praising, I'm using my tools. When you see me walking in love, when I should punch you in the, oh, y'all ain't saying nothing. I'm using my tool. You ought to be glad I got these tools. Because if I didn't have these tools, I would have to use what I want to use. And what I want to use ain't holy. <laughs> Jesus dealt with this with his disciples. He dealt with it, and, and he did it intentionally and strategically because the only thing that can calm your fears is the intentionality of God. The only thing that can calm your fears is the intentionality of God, is knowing that the God that we serve is intentional. No, intent means it's by design. It's on purpose. Intent means that it's not happenstance. And intent means, Bishop Priest of Message one time called, nothing just happens. And intent means that it was purposed by design. God is intentional. He is so intentional, it is unswervingly so. He does not deviate from his intent. Jesus shows us this when, when he takes his disciples and they're passing by Caesarea Philippi in Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter, and, and, and they're passing by Caesarea Philippi and they find themselves in Panaeus, or Banaeus is pronounced with a B because there's no P in Arabic, and so it's, it's Banaeus, and it's this, this grotto-like cave location that the spring waters flow up from, and this is the place in the Greek and Roman world where they would come and they their polytheistic mentality to worship many gods. And one of the gods that they would worship was a Greek god by the name of Pan. Pan was half goat and half man, and he played a harp. And so he had worship as a pied piper, but he would lead people into panic, and so much panic that they would fall down into the hole in the cave. And so Jesus, at this location, looks at the disciples and says, who do men say that I am? In a location where they worship Pan, Pan is the root word for pandemic and panic and pandemonium. And this is where God intentionally stops and says, who do men say that I? God stops them, the Lord stops them and says, who? Do men say that I am? What is the world saying about me? And so they said, some, some say that you're Elijah, and some say that you're one of the prophets that's come back. And, and, and he says, oh, that's complimentary. That's all well and fine. That's all well and good. But what I'm really interested in is not what the world is saying. But who do you say that I am? Oh, you ought to look at somebody and say, I know who he is. See, I know him as a way maker. I know who he is. I know him as a keeper. I know who he is. I know him as a deliverer. I know who he is. I know him as a strong tower. 
I know who he is. When you know who God is, you can understand that he's intentional. God is complex, but he's never ambiguous. <laughs> oh, he's going to tell you. He's going to tell you. Oh, you're going to go through some stuff. Jesus told us because the Bible never promised us a world without trouble. He said, in this world, you will have But as long as you know who I am, you ought to be of good cheer. For I, watch me now, have, not will, not about to, have overcome the world. Help me, Holy Ghost. God deals with this with his disciples to say, if you know who I am, you should not be in a panic. If you know what I am, a calm should come over your life and over your soul and over your heart. Those heart palpitations should stop. That shortness of breath should go away because when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all Time for me, my soul, where I'm panicking at, cries out, Hallelujah, which is the highest praise. My soul cries the highest praise because there's no reason. Y'all ain't in here with me. Hallelujah. I hallel Yah, which means I celebrate Jehovah. Actually translated, I go to acting a fool when I hear the name of God. Because I would rather be crazy over my God than crazy over my circumstance. God, I feel the Lord in here. I'd rather look crazy for my God than look crazy for my trouble. If I'm going to look crazy, it's going to be for him. But these circumstances are not about to drive me crazy. As a matter of fact, my praise and my proclamation of his goodness is about to drive my circumstances right out of my life. My God, I feel the Lord here. Just nudge somebody and say something amazing is about to happen in your life. My God, just look at somebody online. Talk to the dog or the cat if you have to. Talk to the baby and say something amazing is about to. I feel it in here already. I feel it in here already. I feel it in here already. It's in the atmosphere. It's in the house. It's on your pew. It's in your chair. Something. This is what John is trying to tell us. And John is trying to tell us that God is intentional. He's echoing the words of Isaiah. When Isaiah said, I declare the end from the beginning. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it springs forth. My God, I feel this thing. Help me, Holy Ghost. Now it springs forth. Somebody shout now. Come on, Holy Spirit. Somebody shout now. 
I heard your Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost said every time you shout now, something is leaving your life and what God wants to happen in your life is about to show up. Somebody shout now. Oh God, I feel this thing. Somebody in the rafter, just shout now. Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here it comes, here it comes. Here's that wave of glory. Here it comes. And it's coming. Oh, it's in the room. It's in the room. It's in the room. It's here right now. It's here right now. It's here right John is trying to tell us that because of God's intent, everything that you're worrying about he's working on. The child that you're worrying about, he's working on. The loved one that has you up at night, he's working on. The situation you can't tell nobody about, only him. He's working on. Oh God, the thoughts that are in your mind. He's working on. John is trying to tell us that everything that we're worried about, God is working on. And so it is in a cave like grotto on the Isle of Patmos as a prisoner in exile that God decides to intentionally give John a revelation. While I'm in exile, while there's pandemonium going on, while everybody is in a panic, you want to come now? and give me a revelation? You couldn't have did it when I was at peace. You couldn't have did it when I was feeling good. You couldn't have did it if I can go old school when I was driving in my car with a diamond in the back. Where my old school folk at? Sunroof top. Digging a scene with my woo. You want to wait until everything is in an uproar? It's dark in this grotto. It's damp in this cave. And this is where you want to give me a revelation? In my darkest moment? When it seems like all hope is lost, you want to come and give me a Revelation? And John comes to let us know that even in my darkest moment, I was in the Spirit. Because my position 
it's really not my position. <laughs> Come on, track with me, track with me, track, track. Paul said it this way <laughs> while he was in a Roman jail cell. He said, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So my, my position is really not my position. And he gets a revelation, and it's a revelation of Jesus, of the testimony of Christ. The revelation that he is getting is the revelation that this is God's covenant purpose that is tracking harmoniously from the old covenant to the new covenant. Because the old covenant is the new covenant concealed and the new covenant is the old covenant revealed. So what John stepped into is how the story ends. And he is inviting us through his eyes to join him as eavesdroppers on the conversation of a private affair. Heaven is talking about you. I'm giving you the purse lips right here. Because if anybody was talking about you, anybody, if it was a coworker, if it was a family member, if it was a friend, if it was strangers, you would go, what they say? Yeah, I know they ain't talking about me. If it was complimentary, you would go, oh, what they, what they say, what they say, what they say. You would be excited or you would be upset. If anybody was talking about you and you found out, I just told you, heaven. Heaven is having a conversation. about you. Come on, I'm almost there. 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 And so the first thing that John shows us in the conversation is the picture of the throne. Look at your name and say, you got to get the big picture. He wants you to see the big picture. And the big picture is that God is on the throne. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he doesn't even describe God in detail. He just says someone is sitting on the throne. There's a reason that he says someone is sitting on the throne. I'll get there later. But he says someone is sitting on the throne. And there's around him like a sea of glass that looks like jasper and, and sardine stone. It's like emerald and shimmery and shining, and it's all around him. And as all of that is around him, he then begins to describe the atmosphere that's going on, that's all around God, and that there are these creatures that are flying, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So in the big picture, there's perpetual worship. Praise is going forth in the big picture. And then there are 24 elders. The 24 elders is a culmination of the old and, and the new covenant that the 12 tribes of Israel in the old covenant and the 12 apostles in the new covenant are now seated around the throne, worshiping God. 
And every time they go into a worship, the Bible says that the 24 elders take their crowns and they cast them down before the Lord because hope will take you up, but humility will keep you there. Oh my God, did our bishop just not talk to us about the infectious disease of entitlement? Hope will take you up, but humility will keep you there. And in humility, they cast down their crowns before the Lord and they begin to join with all of the hosts and the angels crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. They begin to shout and they begin to praise and they begin to sing. And John is witnessing all of this glory and splendor in the big picture. There's panic and disruption going on down in the earth, but in heaven there's worship and praise going on on in the earth there's panic and there's distress but in the heavens y'all not in here with me there's praise and worship going on the reason that there's praise and worship going on is because in the big picture God already knows it's finished he already knows what the outcome is going to be he already knows that no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper he already knows. And as we join John through his eyes, we see this worship taking place. And in the worship, the angels are crying, holy, holy, holy. And the creatures are crying, holy, holy, holy. And the elders are prostrating before the Lord. And then all of a sudden, he sees a little bit closer. God is taking him into dimensional views of his glory because we go from glory to glory. And we're experiencing the multi-dimensional nature of God's glory. God's glory means his his weightiness and his awesomeness and his heaviness. That means all of that is about to plot right down on your life. And, and so we're witnessing all of that take place and all of that go on. And as we're witnessing it all, all of a sudden John sees a scroll, a book in the hand of the one who sits on the throne. And the angel steps up and says, who is worthy? to open the scroll and the seals thereof. Theologically speaking, I do not have time to wax eloquent about all of the seven seals in the series of the seven sevens that found themselves in the book of Revelation. That is not my assignment this morning. If you want an in-depth study, go ahead and do it, baby. Go ahead and help yourself. But I'm here this morning to let you know that the scroll that he sees in God's hand is God's covenant purpose. It's the work that he wants to do. It's what's about to happen. It's what's about to take place. And the process the problem is that there is nobody worthy to open the project that God is about to produce. And so we see this big picture, and in the big picture, we see what God is working on. And the problem, brothers and sisters, is that there's nobody that can look into what God is working on. Where there is no vision, The people perish. And so there's nobody there that's worthy to open the scroll that's sealed with seven seals. And John begins to cry. God, how can you bring me this close? How can you bring me this close? to what you're working on and not show me. God, how could you let all of this pandemonium be going on and y'all up here having a party? While all this is happening, and he's crying. And just like an elder does, one of the elders in heaven says, oh, cut that out. 
This is not in the text, but I imagine in my prophetic imagination, I, 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 I imagine these words that the elder would say to, to him, that, that John, cut that out. God did not bring you this far to bring you this far. I'm gonna try it over here because y'all too quiet. God did not bring you this far to bring you this far. That means wherever you are now, there is another dimension. There's not another level, there's another dimension. A dimension is a degree of freedom. See, if you go to another level, you can only go up. But if you go to another dimension, you can go down, you can go up, you can go right, you can go left and still find yourself. When I'm free to move, like I need to move. Somebody shout us up from here, baby. So the elder says, I did not bring you this far. I'm, in, I'm interjecting it into the text. Don't, don't call me a heretic. But he says, stop that crying. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is worthy to look into what God has been working on. Ain't it amazing that God can see what, what, what the outcome is going to be? That's why he would sleep in the boat with the disciples. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't get it out of my head. That's why he would sleep when the storm is going on. Because, because he already told them that you're going to make it to the other side. And when God said you're going to make it to the other side, ain't no need of you crying over the storm. Oh, somebody shout, I'm going to make it, baby, I'm going to make it. Not because I feel like it, not because I got this business acumen, not because I got all this knowledge, but God said I'm going to. Come on, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. And so in the big picture, John shows us the project that God is working on. And he discovers that the, land, that the line of the tribe of Judah is worthy to go and open this book, this scroll that's been sealed. And so he looks again, and all of a sudden, sees a lamb. I, I, yeah, I know. It baked my noodle too. Flipped my whole wig when I read it. Brain fried. He sees the lion of the tribe of Judah that's worthy to open the scroll, but the lamb shows up. And so John, I can only imagine, in the spirit, got his spiritual popcorn and was like, I wonder what's going to happen now. Ooh, this getting good. Just look at somebody and say, ooh, this getting good. The lamb shows up and the lamb shows up and the lamb looks like it had been slain, but it's sitting there looking dead, but it's yet alive. I came to prophetically declare to somebody, you shall live and not die and declare the works of God because you cannot kill what God wants living. You cannot curse what God wants blessed.
So he shows the lamb, and the lamb is standing there. The line of the tribe of Judah won the victory by becoming the lamb. You're not panicking because you're weak. You're panicking because you tried to be too strong for too long. Panic is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of you trying to be too strong for too long. You've been trying to do it yourself. But we are stepping into a moment where only God can do what needs to be done. And if he don't do it, it ain't going to get done. But somebody needs to understand that God is about to do what only he can do. I'm coming to my, my little clothes there. And so the lamb walks up and takes the scroll. And when the lamb walks up and takes the scroll, the Bible says that the 24 elders are standing there and they're holding harps and they're holding golden bowls. And in the golden bowls looks like incense. And the incense that's in the bowls are the prayers. Of the saints. That means your prayer went to the next dimension before you did. Somebody help, y'all turn this thing on. Somebody help me up in here. Your prayer went to the next dimension before you did. But God sent me on assignment this morning to tell somebody it's up from here. You are about to meet the prayer you have been waiting for and show up in the place you have been hoping for. Somebody shout, it's up from here. My God, I feel the Lord in here already. I feel the Lord in here already. I feel the Lord in here already. This is not a sermon. That's what you don't understand. This is not a message. That's what you don't understand. This is a prophetic declaration over your life. It is up from God is working on everything he purposed. And my prayers are in the midst of everything he purposed. What John is allowing us to discover is that the conversation in heaven is about us. I wish somebody would get this. I wish somebody would get that. God is talking about you and he's saying you're about to win. He's saying you're about to get the victory. He's saying you're about to come from where you are and you're about to go up. God is trying to tell you that your struggling days are over. God is trying to tell you that your dead days are over. God is trying to tell you that your sorrowful days are Somebody shout, it's over, it's over, it's over, it's over. The devil thought he had me, but it's over. The devil thought I was dead and gone, but it is over. And so, my brothers and sisters, as 
we find ourselves stepping away from this text in the next few moments here, we have to understand this very important principle that heaven is having a conversation about us. And the conversation that they're having is letting us know that everything that happens after this simply means that it's up from here. Ah, God, I feel the power of the Holy Spirit at this place. Everything in your life, you ought to get in your imagination right now and look at it the way it is. Don't run from the reality and say to yourself, but it's about to be up from here. I know I'm broke, but it's about to be up from here. I I know I'm messed up, but it's about to be up. And so John, in my closing, <sighs> shows us the big picture. And in the big picture, he shows us the project that God is working on. And inside of God's project is our prayers. And watch this, watch this. It is not lost on me that this text fits with this day. Because in actuality, Pastor Tubman, in actuality, John getting this revelation in chapter 4 and 5 is the beginning of beginnings. It's the beginning of the revelation of the testimony of Christ. Today is eight eight. I'm about to, I'm about to, I'm about to, I'm about to, I'm about to run, I'm about to run, I'm about to run, I'm about to shout. Today is the beginning of the beginnings. You about to step into something completely fresh, completely new, completely God life changing and life altering. And so, under assignment today, and out of unadulterated obedience to God, I stand undaunted in this moment. And I say to you that it's about to be up from here. My God, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in this place. Somebody shout up from here. And God told me to tell you to do this. It's going to look crazy. It's going to look stupid. It's going to sound stupid to somebody who is intelligent. I, I got my education. I got degrees too. But if I'm going to look crazy, I'm going to look crazy for my God. And God told me to tell you to do this. And I'm going to do it with you. Because it's about to be up from here. There's another dimension that you are about to operate in. There's another dimension that your family is about to walk in. Every generational curse is broken over your life. This is the beginning of beginnings. Diabetes won't be able to find itself down into the DNA of your heritage. Cancer will not be able to find itself down into your lineage. Disease won't be able to find itself down into the DNA of your family. Debt and poverty is about to lose its stronghold over the life of your family. Today is the beginning of beginnings. It is 
up from here. And God told me to tell you, with every step of faith you decide to take, every time you lift your foot up and you put it down, he's taking you up from glory to glory, from faith to faith. Somebody shout, I'm about to go up. I hope you're ready because when I put my foot on this step, not only you're going up, but you're going out. You're about to be blessed in the city and blessed in the field and blessed when you come and blessed when you go. God never brings you out without completely taking you in. It's about to be up from here. You're about to come out of everything you need to come out of, but you're about to go into everything that you need to go into. Somebody shout, is up from here take the first step and shout I'm going up I wish I had a shouting church in here and give God a shout of praise and say I just took a step up my bills just got paid off I just took a step up the door of opportunity just opened I just took a step up somebody take another step and shout I'm going Get out of your seat if you have to. Move out of your pew if you must. But you gotta take a step of faith and shout, I'm going. I hear your Holy Ghost. I hear your Holy Ghost. I hear you, Holy Ghost. I hear you. Somebody saying, this is goofy. How in the world me taking these steps got anything to do with the revelation of the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, when you know who he is and you know that he said, wherever you place the sole of your foot, that the Lord thy God would give it to you. And you got to do it on the canvas of your imagination. The same way that you panic, you got to begin to praise God for where you're about to step. See yourself stepping into greatness and take another step see yourself stepping into favor and take another step see yourself stepping into healing and take another step see yourself one more time stepping into power and take another It's up from here, 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 it's up from here. God is working on what you have been worried about. Listen to me, don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment. God help our hearts to understand. God moves in moments. You can be so busy trying to get out of here that you miss this moment you're online step all over your house step all over your property step all over the hospital grounds you can't get in there to see your loved ones but go take a step of faith and declare it's up from here Don't miss this moment. I want to do two things. I cannot physically lay my hands on you, but the Holy Spirit will do that. You're here right now. I told her, 
and you're tired and you're frustrated and you don't know what God is doing and you're holding on to everything you got to trust him and believe him God says I want you to meet me at this altar right now because I need you to know that your struggling days are over today is the beginning of beginnings mark this moment in time that this was the day I went up I'm going up in my capacity I'm going up in my thinking I'm going up in my relationships I'm going up I'm going up in my finances my family is going up I'm going up because the God we serve is not just taking you it's taking your kids too ah. It's up from here. It's up from here. And God says to John, come up here. Stop settling to live on such a low level. When you serve an omnipotent God, you don't have to stay down there. You don't have to stay in depression. You don't have to stay broke. You don't have to stay unhappy. You don't have to do that. Christ has set us free. And so we stand in the liberty where Christ has set us free. On a day that is the beginning of beginnings. For those of you who are not at this altar, I want you to do two things. I want you praying for everybody down here. If you know you need to be here, just come on out that seat. This is your day. This is your moment. I'll wait for you. It's all right. This is your time. It is up from here. They say to avoid panic, you have to have good information. That's what the experts say. I'm not disagreeing, but I want to add something to that. I say to really avoid panic, you need a revelation. The word apocalypse doesn't mean the end. The word apocalypse means to uncover. That's all it means. And so when we look at apocalyptic literature, like in Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel and the synoptics, it's not telling us that it's the end. It's telling us that God is about to do something new. And when you look at the book of Revelation, it is not your doom. It is your destiny. That you win in the end. Come on, lift those hands right where you are. Today, is symbolic of what was just preached to you. It is 8-8. And God reserve this moment for your healing, for your refreshing, for your restoration, for your renewal, for your recovery. You are about to recover all. My God, I feel the Lord here. 
Father, I can't touch them. You're going to have to. You are about to recover all. You are about to recover all. You are about to recover all. The beginning of beginnings. Come on, let God touch you. Come on, just worship them at the altar. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Right where you are, lift those hands right where you are and begin to worship the Lord and give him glory right where you are. He's doing a new thing in you right now. He's birthing a new thing in your spirit right now, in your heart, in your soul, in your mind right now. As you're at this altar, let your worship go up before him. He's working on it all. 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 He's working on cast all your cares. Cast all your cares. Cast all your cares. He's working on it all. He's working on it all. Father. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody's getting breakthrough right now. Somebody's getting breakthrough right now. My God. Father, you are talking about us. You are the someone that John saw on the throne. And what he saw was that we were at the center of the conversation. Hallelujah. You got plans for us. Yes, Lord. Uh. Oh, yes, Lord. You got plans for us. Yes, Lord. We know the plans that you have toward us. Plans to prosper us. Plans to give us a hope and a future. Yes, Lord, yes, Plans Lord. to bring us to an expected end. Yes, Lord, so yes, Father, Lord. we anticipate the inevitable, the supernatural intervention of God. We yes. expect miracles and signs and wonders yes. and blessings and healings and peace and joy. Yes, we expect it. Because it's ours. We don't deserve it. But you're giving it to us. We shouldn't have it. But it's your grace and mercy. So we thank you. That today. Is the beginning. Of my beginning. Of going up from here. And I praise you in advance for how good it's going to look. Hallelujah. Put those hands together and give God a shout of praise right yes, here, right now. Lord. Yeah, God. Come on, yes, praise Lord. him and every yoke destroy. Yes, Lord. And every shackle yes, Lord. and chain fall yes, off of Lord. you with the praise that yes, comes out of your Lord. mouth. Lift your yes, voice Lord. and give God glory. Yes. Listen, I got to do this quickly. God is talking about you. I thought God could never love me. I thought I, thought I could never be used of the Lord. I thought God don't use people like me. There's no way in the world he could use a hoodlum like me. I know I got this suit on, but don't get it twisted. Uh, I'm just hood. I just, that's, that's what it is. Uh, and I'm so glad that he keeps working on me. And he never stops. So salvation is not about perfection. It's about progress. (laughs) 
it is a progressive experience that when you come to the Lord you keep growing from faith to faith and glory to glory from one dimension to the next And if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, the Bible says that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I am a whosoever will. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. I'm a whosoever will. And at 19 years old, at 19 years old, after smoking five blunts and drinking a whole fifth of vodka in a revival service, God found me on a third row of a pew, filled me with the Holy Ghost, and put his word in my mouth. And I have been preaching the gospel ever since yes, that day. Lord. Don't tell me what God cannot do. Yes. He can take your weed smoking, drinking self, and transform you. Because any man that's in Christ, it's a new creation. Old yes, things passed away. Behold, all things are made new. I'm a witness. I'm a witness. That son you worried about, God working on him. That daughter you worried about, God working on her. That cousin that you stressed out about, God, God working on him. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To be saved means to be made well, preserved, kept safe, healed, delivered, and set free. You're not saved from something, you're saved for something. You're not saved to escape hell. Y'all not in here with me. <laughs> That is a byproduct of your salvation, but that is not the purpose of your salvation. You're not saved from something, you're saved for something. And if the church would have told me when I was a teenager that I was saved for something, then just maybe, just maybe, just maybe I would have did a little bit earlier, but they never told me that. They just told me, don't go to hell. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. I said, well, none of that is fun. I'm going to go have me some fun. And God came through all of that and changed my life. He wants to change yours. So right now, just lift that hand if you're a whosoever will and say, Father, come into my life. Save me from myself. Change me. Rearrange me. Make me new again. And if you've prayed that prayer, wherever you are, right online, he's coming into your life right now to set you free from sin and death and sickness and disease and torment and evil. You belong to him. Jesus is your Lord. Devil, back up. You have no claim. You have no right. You have no stake. They are God's chosen. And we thank you for every life right now. I want you to do something else. We got to go. This is the beginning of beginnings. It is 8-8. And I want you to take a step of faith and get a seat of $88 in your hand. As soon as you do it, just bring it to the altar. If you're doing it on your phone, do it on your phone. But do it as unto the Lord. Come on, they're worshiping. You're getting in a seat in your hand. If you're online and you're watching right now and on YouTube, today is 8-8. And I want to challenge your faith and get a seat of $88 in your hand. Nobody asked me to do it. I'm just doing it prompted by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, do it right now. Get it in your hand. Bring it to the altar. We're going to come and bring this close and this worship can I give the benediction I can I can come on I want to give you the benediction right now come on stand with me all over the church you can still bring your seed it's all right stand with me all over the church all over the church Lift those hands. Today is the beginning of beginnings. Today, you realize heaven is talking about you. 
today you see the big picture today you go into another dimension yes, Lord. because it's up from here now may God bless you may God keep you may his face shine upon you may God be gracious unto you and give you peace May he surround you with his favor like yeah. a shield. Yeah. May his angels encamp themselves round about you. And may his precious blood yeah. cover you from now to eternity. Yes. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. amen. God bless you. I love you. It's up from here.